Okay, so now that we've talked about some of the general characteristics and the similarities and the differences at a higher level, let's dig a little bit deeper. In particular, we'll talk about some of the cloud patterns that we see here, uh, starting with uh, Jupiter. Uh, this is an image made by the Galileo spacecraft it visited during the 1990s and gave us the highest resolution images of Jupiter's clouds that we have uh, seen yet to date. Uh, incidentally, there's another spacecraft called Juno that's on its way, uh, so hopefully we'll get some better images from Juno when, uh, when she gets there. But for the time being, uh, these uh, images from Galileo will do us just fine. Uh, one thing about Jupiter is that it has far and away the most complex cloud patterns of all the giant planets. Uh, you'll notice these very prominent alternating light and dark cloud bands. And in fact, these bands are visible uh, from Earth, even in a good pair of binoculars. And those of you that have uh, accompanied me to the observatory after class a couple times this semester, uh, we've had a chance to take a look at Jupiter, and uh, right there, uh, just taking a look at it, the first thing you notice uh, about Jupiter is that it looks like a disk. You see a, uh, a complete planet there, and you've got those prominent dark uh, and light bands alternating. Uh, and that tells us something uh, about the characteristics of Jupiter that we're going to explore in, great de in greater detail. But for the time being, it tells us a lot about the characteristics of its rotation, as well as the uh, chemistry that's taking place uh, in the atmosphere. So there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on, but mostly we're talking about a very complex uh, chemistry that we have. Um, remember, hydrogen is the most abundant element in Jupiter, so most of the chemistry involved uh, is going to be uh, a manifestation of hydrogen. There'll be some compounds of hydrogen reacting with other compounds of hydrogen, uh, thus giving us these, uh, these interesting colors. Uh, but we also see storms in the atmosphere as well, uh, the uh, most famous of which is the Great Red Spot. I never said that astronomers were good at naming things. It's just what it's called, the Great Red Spot. And it's been visible uh, for quite some time. Uh, in fact, it wasn't long, as I mentioned uh, in an earlier lecture, Galileo uh, discovered uh, some of the characteristics of Jupiter using his spyglass. And it wasn't long after Galileo's initial observations that astronomers began noticing uh, that Jupiter had a, a spot in addition to these bands, and that spot turned out to be uh, the largest storm in the solar system. As a matter of fact, it's about twice the size of Earth. I mean, two Earths could fit in there. It's pretty huge. Uh, but there are many other storms that come and go uh, throughout, uh, you know, we can even watch them happen on, on a time scale of as uh, short as a few months to just a few years. Uh, the Great Red Spot, however, has endured for about uh, 350. Some astronomers think uh, the spot may have been around for 500 years. So it's a massive cyclone. But one of the things that's interesting about this for its, for its enormous size and its aptly named title, Great Red Spot, uh, it's not as great as it used to be. As a matter of fact, it's been shrinking. These are some Hubble Space Telescope images of Jupiter, and you can clearly see that the Great Red Spot has gotten smaller uh, from 1995 uh, through 2014, just last year. As a matter of fact, we can line these up against some parallel lines, and you can really begin to see that it actually has uh, lost a, a, a decent, you know, not insignificant uh, amount of its former self. In fact, it seems to be shrinking at a rate of 580 kilometers per year, and it's really not quite clear as to why that's happening. Uh, there could be a, a kind of a reduction in the uh, fuel that's powering it. Uh, maybe there's some thermal differences uh, going on under there. It isn't clear, but one of the things that uh, I forgot to mention, I'd like to mention right now, uh, that makes the Great Red Spot unique, and one of the reasons these storms can last as long as they do on these planets is, again, there is no surface, right? So it's not like we think about a hurricane here on Earth uh, making landfall, and as soon as it uh, comes over the land, it runs out of the moisture to be drawn up. There's no more ocean underneath it to, to fuel the hurricane. 
That's not the case here. There's nothing but fuel underneath these storms. There is no surface uh, to, to break the storm up. So it isn't clear what is causing the Great Red Spot to shrink right now. Uh, and it's not clear if it will continue shrinking and just become a spot and eventually die out or if it will grow back again. Uh, so it, it remains to be seen, but it's a, it's a very interesting observation. When we take a look at Saturn, we do see some patterns that are similar to Jupiter's, but they're much less pronounced. Uh, you know, these colors are are subdued. First of all, they're they're much less pronounced. There's a, there's few of them. There there are fewer uh, cloud patterns. They're not quite as intricate and twisted up as you see uh, in Jupiter, and the colors, uh, of course, are much more subdued. This is a visible. Uh, really a, a natural color image of Saturn taken by the Hubble telescope. If you were on board a spacecraft looking at Saturn's atmosphere, it would probably look something like this. And yes, you do see some bands there, but it's not as pronounced. The colors are subdued. Well, again, Saturn's atmosphere is composed largely of hydrogen and helium, just like Jupiter, but the colors are different. That tells us that the chemistry going on in the atmosphere must be slightly different. Uh, you know, often you'll see some small, scattered, bright, and dark clouds appearing and disappearing, um, but uh, there, there's just not a whole lot going on. Uh, although, storms are not as uh, frequent on Saturn, but it does in fact seem uh, to have a jet stream. I mean, there is some interesting activity uh, observed in the atmospheres of Saturn, including, uh, you know, uh, something that kind of looks like our jet stream here on Earth. I mean, you've got a, uh, a zone of fast moving uh, wind or, you know, some kind of uh, some kind of material is blowing through what appear to be alternating high and low pressure regions. Now, if you've ever learned anything about fluid dynamics, uh, you know, i.e. the motions of gases and liquids that are collect the gases and liquids are collectively known as fluids, uh, you'll know that fluids tend to want to flow from high pressure to low pressure. So they're kind of zigzagging, you know, picking up speed as it goes from, as it, as it approaches the high pressure, then accelerating toward the low pressure, and then picking up some speed from the high pressure, and just giving us this wavy pattern, not unlike our jet stream uh, here on Earth. But Saturn is also uh, capable of having storms. It's just not as uh, often as you see here on, uh, as we've seen earlier rather, on Jupiter. So take a look at this. This is a sequence of images made by the Cassini spacecraft uh, in uh, late 2010 and 2011, and a storm erupted that was carried by Saturn's uh, very high speed winds. It blew the storm debris, if you will, uh, all the way around the planet, wrapping itself around the planet. And here's a Here's a detail of it. It was a really spectacular storm. And these storms are uh, probably not uh, exceptionally rare, but they're certainly far less common than we typically will see on Jupiter. So what about the ice giants and what cloud patterns do we see here? Well, these two images of the, of the ice giants were captured by Voyager 2, and they're undoubtedly uh, the highest resolution images, the clearest, sharpest images we'll ever see of these planets until we build a colossal telescope or send, better yet, send a probe uh, to visit these worlds uh, once again. But uh, when, when uh, Uranus was uh, passed by uh, in 1986, uh, there wasn't really any weather going on there. Uh, Neptune, however, had some interesting weather that we could then uh, do some detailed studies of. But um, in general, when it comes to these cloud patterns, uh, you know, they're, they're really featureless, really, compared to Jupiter uh, and Saturn, particularly Jupiter. And um, this is because uh, whenever we look at these worlds, uh, there's a tremendous amount of methane. Uh, in the uh, in the atmospheres, and, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But for now, I'm just going to make some observations that you know the banding is present. You can see it. This is a, a slightly enhanced uh, image uh, made by the Hubble Space Telescope. We're kind of stretching things out a little bit in uh, in our uh, photo imaging software to kind of bring out some of these details. 
you can see that there are, in fact, uh, some tiny storms here, and tiny's relative. Uh, if you look just to the right of the equator, kind of on the right half of the image of Uranus here, you'll see a darker smudge that's about uh, the size of North America. So you do see storms, but rather than storms uh, plowing into one another and colliding and forming with one another, as we saw on Jupiter and on Saturn, here the storms are kind of you know, isolated. They kind of come and they and they go. It, it's not quite as spectacular. Uh, there are some uh, atmos uh, upper atmospheric uh, ice cr ice crystals that formed in Neptune's cloud tops as Jupiter sped on by. And it's worth mentioning that everything that we know about the rotation of these uh, gas giants is based on observations, very careful observations, of these cloud features. So anytime we can find a feature, whatever it is in the atmosphere, it might be a storm or a low pressure region or whatever, anything that we can visually lock onto, we can then watch it and watch it rotate uh, around the planet. That tells us uh, about the planet's rotation. Uh, one of these uh, occasional storms, though, the very famous uh, storm that uh, was spotted by Voyager 2 was on Neptune. It was a, uh, a, a, an immense uh, low-pressure region. Uh, it was dark in color, so astronomers called it the Great Dark Spot. Again, I never said we were good at naming this stuff. But Neptune is so far away from the sun. Remember, we're 30 astronomical units away from the sun. We're the farthest... Uh, you know, planet effectively from the sun, everybody assumed that Neptune was going to be completely dead. There wouldn't be anything interesting to see at Neptune. And lo and behold, there was incredible weather, including this huge Earth-sized storm, the Great Red, the Great Dark Spot, excuse me. Uh, however, unlike the Great Red Spot on Jupiter, the Great Dark Spot uh, had disappeared uh, by the time the Hubble Space Telescope got a look at it in 1994. So in just five years, uh, the great dark spot was gone. But there was a new dark spot that had formed in Neptune's northern hemisphere. So these are storms that, you know, come and they go, and sometimes they're pretty spectacular and sometimes not. Uh, so it's not 100% clear as to why that's the case, uh, but it is very interesting. And by the way, um, in order to really explore uh, Neptune and Uranus, you pretty much have to uh, go into the infrared in order to really begin to peer, be peer beneath some of that upper atmospheric haze and reveal uh, some of the cloud features or some of the atmospheric structure underneath. It's just a, a consequence of dealing with gas giants that are dominated, uh, in this case, or I should say ice giants, excuse me, that are dominated by methane and so forth. They're really good uh, at absorbing red light and they scatter the blue light. So infrared's kind of a handy way to do this. But let's talk a little bit about um, getting underneath the cloud layers. And let's talk initially about the two gas giants. So we have Jupiter's atmosphere uh, as depicted, <coughs> excuse me, as depicted in the illustration. And, um, you know, these outer planets have been extensively studied by, you know, flybys, uh, orbital missions. In the case of Jupiter and Saturn, they've each had orbiters uh, flying around them. Uh, the ice giants had a flyby, uh, one flyby each by Voyager 2. And, uh, you know, on each planet, the density, the composition, uh, and the circulation patterns uh, are very different at each altitude. So... In all cases, uh, the temperature and the pressure both increase uh, as you work your way downward into each atmosphere. Uh, so the temperature uh, and the densities, uh, they become high, at least compared to Earth's atmosphere. They become pretty high uh, after only a short distance into the atmosphere, particularly here at Jupiter. Uh, as you can see, uh, we're uh, only 100 kilometers down and we're at roughly 10 atmospheres. Okay, so you can get, you know, considering the size of Jupiter, uh, we're talking, you know, 11 times, a little more than 11 times the radius of the Earth, uh, you get just 100 kilometers down and you're already at 10 atmospheres. It's, it's, the pressure's building up pretty quickly and uh, as is the temperature. So uh, that tells us a lot, something interesting about Jupiter. It's, it's, a, it's a pretty, you know, as gas giants go, it's dense, if you will. Uh, one of the things that um, 
we could take a look at and back and bring up some of these bullets here just to have these uh, the different cloud layers uh, you know are formed at different heights okay so you have uh, an appearance of the planets that are arising because of the way their cloud layers are structured they form at different temperatures and at different pressures so for example here on jupiter the bright upper layer clouds are made of ammonia uh, crystals okay and they form at a temperature of about 133 kelvin uh, but then uh, going deeper the darker lower level clouds are formed from ammonium hydrosulfide and that forms at 193 kelvin so you got to get a little bit deeper uh, where the temperatures are warmer to start picking up the ammonium hydrosulfide ice that's when you can begin to get those uh, orange like tabby colors in the uh, cloud tops of Jupiter just to compare uh, to Saturn uh, just to give you some idea again it's largely the same structure however because uh, Saturn uh, doesn't get uh, the pressure doesn't reach 10 atmospheres until you are nearly twice as deep in the atmosphere so saturn is far less dense therefore the uh the atmospheric layers aren't nearly as compressed as they are in jupiter so you have a, a broader region of ammonia ice and a broader region of ammonium hydrosulfides and so forth again all of the this this uh this greater depth uh involve you know results in a slightly different chemistry resulting in a slightly different appearance of saturn so what about uh the ice giant cloud layers well here we're looking at uranus and the temperature and the pressure increase downward uh, as we saw with the gas giants uh, so you do get to increase temperatures and pressures the deeper you go uh, but because the ice giants have less mass they have less gravity and because they have less gravity the values of these pressures and temperatures just don't increase as as high as they do for the gas giants so therefore the highest clouds that we see are of a very different composition they're they're made mostly of methane ice which absorbs the redder wavelengths of light and that leaves the blue wavelengths to be scattered in the atmosphere making the planets uh, really appear uh, gives them their their bluish green appearance uh, so the color of the clouds on Jupiter and Saturn by the way should be crystal clear we should see uh, well through and deep into the uh, atmosphere uh, but because they have impurities in their atmospheres uh, they that that helps uh, give off their color uh, that's how Jupiter and Saturn get their colors due to impurities Uranus and Neptune get their blue colors uh, due to the presence of methane that is very good at absorbing uh, the red light and scattering the blue. So just to compare that again uh, with uh, Neptune, and, Neptune and Uranus, again, very similar. Uranus uh, is slightly less massive than Neptune, therefore its uh, cloud layers are a little bit broader. Now, one of the things that's uh, really interesting about these these planets is that they have all of this weather or at least three of them do Uranus not so much but even even Uranus has a little bit of weather they all have these dramatic storms and so forth and yet they are extremely far from the Sun and the farther away you go from the Sun the less sunlight you get Re remember that sunlight decreases due to the inverse square law and that's not true of the Sun that that's true of any uh, of any light source so by the time you are at Jupiter's distance the Sun is much smaller in the sky and you're receiving considerably less light not just you know uh, not a linear amount but going off as one over the distance squared so it really drops off very rapidly uh, Jupiter is getting just you know about 1 27th as much sunlight as Earth and yet it's got all of that weather uh, Neptune has all that weather and it's way way out at 30 astronomical units uh, so the sky from these planets has a brightness similar to twilight here on earth you know just it's just kind of dim there's not much to see uh, so where are they getting all of this uh, energy from 
to have all of this weather. I mean, just take a look at some of this in Saturn. You know, again, it's, at Saturn, we're getting, you know, just 1% uh, of the sunlight. And yet, the temperatures at the cloud tops is a, is a very chilly 135 Kelvin. Uh, but it happens to be at a pressure of one bar, which means that if you were floating around in a spacecraft in the upper atmospheres of Saturn, uh, you could go outside and you wouldn't need to wear a pressure suit. You, you would definitely need to carry your own uh, air supply with you because there's no air to breathe. It's a bunch of other stuff. But you uh, you could just walk around without uh, without a pressure suit. You you would want to wear a parka, however, because it's it's really cold. So where do we get this weather from? Well, that's a question that we're going to talk about in the next segment.